All right. Well, thanks for joining us. Um, really, it's uh, really exciting to be one of the first sessions of the conference. Um, my name is Anna Hermanson. I work for the research department at the Linux Foundation. <laughs> I'm the ecosystem manager, and I also run uh, primarily qualitative research for our portfolio. Um, I'd like to quickly introduce the group. We've decided to forego the kind of 10 minute introductions to get right into the topic. We have a lot of questions we'd like to discuss. Um, but so as, as mentioned, my name's Anna Hermanson. I work for the for LF Research. Um, and we have Adrienne Lawson, who also works with me on the research team. She's our data analyst um, based in Budapest. We have Kaylin Osborne, um, who works for the Linux Foundation as a researcher and based in Colombia <laughs> right now. Um, and Mirko Bohm, who is uh, the op oper operating officer of Linux Foundation Europe, um, acting head uh, of Linux Foundation Europe. Um, and so we're here today to talk about the research that we've recently published on Friday. Um, we run an annual spotlight report on the state of open source in Europe. This is our third year doing it. Um, and we have some findings we're really excited to share with you. So I'm, I'm going to give a, a brief introduction to Linux Foundation research. Adrian will give a bit of an overview of the specific project that we work on every year. And then we'll dive into the meat of the questions. Uh, so uh, Linux Foundation Research is a portfolio within the Linux Foundation that works with our community to answer research questions that um, our, our project and members have on the open source ecosystem. And so we run, like we did with this research, we run geographic trend analysis, we run market trend research, uh, we look at the opportunities and challenges in specific sectors such as healthcare and energy. and um, we started this uh, operation in 2021 because there was a real demand for data behind what's happening in the open source space. Uh, Hillary Carter, who started the portfolio, um, you know, uh, was, was brought on because there's a lot of anecdotal information about open source and how it's trending and what's happening in the market. And, um, and yet there wasn't really a, a group within the LF and even the wider open source community to answer these research questions and have data-driven um, evidence that decision makers, business leaders, uh, data scientists, technologists can use to take back to their companies to say, this is why we need open source, this is why we need to invest here, this is why we need to produce these kind of resources. Um, and so we have, I've left this uh, endorsement up from Gab Colombro, um, the head of, of Linux Foundation Europe, and he um, has provided this lovely endorsement of us, but as an example of uh, how we can take this kind of research that we run and you can um, provide that kind of data-backed insight uh, to understand more what is happening in this space. Uh, we run an annual series, as I mentioned. We call it the World of Open Source series. Our logo is officially, Mirko's head is right in front of it, but um, it was officially trademarked this year, which is exciting. Uh, and so we have reports such as this uh, World of Open Source survey that we run every year to understand these trends in um, different geographies. We have a worldwide report and also a Japan report. Um, and so we're talking today about the Europe report. And so I'll pass it over to Adrian to give an overview of that specific research. And then, like I said, we'll jump into questions. So go ahead. I hope that this is working okay. Thank you. Um, so I'm mainly working with Steve Hendrick on the quantitative side of the LF research. We do surveys um, on many topics, energy transformation, um, technical talent, maintainer perspectives. Um, and this is kind of then complemented with qualitative interviews where we get subject matter experts, um, 
to work with us on these projects. Um, I love the word of open source series uh, because there's a bunch of stuff that we can dig into. Uh, we can do historical analyses. We've been doing this survey since uh, 2022 with the Europe Spotlight, and then we expanded it into global in 2023. Um, we can also look at these regional trends, and do filtering on different regions. Um, we do a Japan Spotlight, um, as you know, in Europe Spotlight, and then the global spotlight really, really dig into the different regional differences that we've seen um, in the world. Um, we are also looking at industry analysis. Um, a bunch of vertical industries are answering our surveys, um, and it's just it, it's great to have a comparison in that area as well. And so um, each year we are able to focus on different areas um, and include. Um, the most kind of emerging topics that are coming up based on regional um, regulatory and economic um, changes. Go. Thank you. Um, this specific survey, um, the global one was uh, kind of completed by 1,200 people. And then we filtered this down to 328 usable responses from Europe, um, as we are going to be focusing on the Europe Spotlight version um, of the survey. Um, we also did interviews, um, kind of a range of industry, the range of industries and um, countries. It, the total was 22 individuals, and the experts are coming from the public sector, private sector, nonprofit, as well as academia. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, so I just wanted to set the stage uh, with our forward. We worked with uh, Wolfgang Gehrig, if I've pronounced that correctly, uh, from Mercedes-Benz, who gave us um, a really generous forward to introduce the report. Um, he spoke about in the in the forward, he speaks about the work that Mercedes Benz does in open source um, and the different projects that they contribute to. Um, but he does have this quote that I've, that I've put up here um, to illustrate this kind of scene setting that we where we want to talk about and where we want to go with this discussion today, which is the idea that we've shifted from unregulated to regulated, regulated. Um, and so. With this forward quote in mind, I'm going to turn it over to the group, um, and maybe we'll start with Mirko. Uh, and so, in this forward, you know, he he talks a bit about, as I said, this shift and this maybe watershed moment, which we've described it before. Um, what are your thoughts after doing this research and and speaking to the the interviewees that you spoke to? Well, the watershed moment that Wolfgang is referring to there is that since this year. Free and open source software is like more or less fully recognized in the European uh, regulatory framework um, as its, uh, its own operator role, basically. So um, we see dedicated mentions and dedicated responsibilities for open source organizations and um, responsibilities for manufacturers in, in what they have to think of when they consume open source dependencies and build them into their products. And, and that's new. That is really a, a change that we've been advocating for in the open source ecosystem for a long period of time. We said this is an, a very important change. Open source changes how we develop digital products. And regulators and, and the public should recognize that, should see the value in that. And um, for the longest time, this felt almost like a hopeless plea. <laughs> it's like, why should regulators care? And, and now they do. And this is really a change. And um, on one hand, I'm really proud of that. Um, living in Europe, seeing the European Union um, responding um, like that, and also showing a very, um, let's say, mature understanding of how open source works at the end of the debate. Um, that makes me really proud. Um, on the other hand, what we see, and you, you can find this in the report, uh, this causes a lot of uncertainty in the community. Um, community organizations, individual contributors ask how this affects their work. We ask ourselves how this will change uh, their motivation to contribute. Uh, and of course, companies ask um, how they should deal with these responsibilities, what, how this changes um, their engagement with upstream communities, etc. We see it overall as a positive trend. It's really a big change and it will be with us for quite some time, a couple of years, uh, until we, the, the community and industry has fully uh, digested it. Yeah, so maybe Adrian, can you speak a bit to how the survey respondents um, dealt with these questions that we asked them about regulation? Uh, 
Yes, of course. Um, so those of you who do complete our surveys, you do see that many of the questions um, include a don't know or not sure answer, which many of the times can seem like, why is it there? It's quite unnecessary to have it in end with question. Now the question on regulation was one where we got 51% of the people saying they, are don't, they don't know or not sure. And the question one was, how does regulation affect in, um, open source participation in your organization? Um, and so here, um, I think it was very clear that we are just, most organizations are just unclear on how this is going to be affecting their companies and how they should then um, actually integrate these policies um, into their everyday works. Um, but those, the, the respondents who didn't say don't or not sure, 23% um, of them said it will positively impact it. 19% it's uh, said that it's it's not going to have an effect and 8% were kind of no negative saying that it will negatively affect participation. So those who do know um, are positive, but there's a lot of uncertainty. Hmm. So I, uh, reading the report uh, after you guys completed it, I noticed there's a, a lot of emphasis on what's going on in the public sector and um, how we have these different understandings of uh, which, which industries and sectors are adopting versus actually implementing or using open source. Um, and so, Kaylin, uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, um, you know, the you use a lot of terms like digital sovereignty, uh, digital democracy, the concept of uh, public money and public code. Um, can you speak a little bit more to that and how that came out in, in your discussions with interviewees? Yeah, thanks, Anna. Um, the report is full of interesting insights, including good and bad news about these concepts. But before I get into them, the folks at the back, would you like to sit down? No pressure. But... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as many people in the room no, in the, the last couple of years, there's been a growing recognition um, of the, the promise of open source in, in the, the public sector. Uh, and the interviews and the survey kind of confirmed this. I brought my notebook here to read out some stats, uh, make sure I get my, my numbers right. But um, it's certainly very, very promising. Um, so, for example, um, the federal national government ranked as the, as the second highest ranking sector that uh, respondents thought would benefit the most from open source uh, with 36% and local and state government ranked fourth with 24%. So that's very promising. Also, when asked about their support for the principle of public money, public code championed by the Free Software Foundation, 82% of respondents said they agreed with that principle. So that's, that's great. Now, uh, how does that translate to, to practice? And this is where we have good news and uh, bad news. Um, so let me start with the bad news. Um, only 30% of uh, respondents said that um, their public sector organization where they worked or have worked in the past had a open source strategy, and that includes a strategy for use, reuse, and contribution at large. And even less, 10% said that they, their organization had an OSPO or a similar organization working on it. So I think there, that shows that there's still a lot of growth for improvement. Um, but there's also some, some good news. And Gab made my life easier this morning in his keynote talking about you know, examples of um, you know, open source, well, public-private sector collaborations, but also international uh, collaboration. He talked about the UN's recent event on OSPOs for Good. He talked about the Open Wallet Forum launched by the Open Wallet Foundation and the ITU and other examples. We heard in the interviews about examples, um, for example, uh, from, the, from the German government that, you know, a shifting understanding about open source is a way to, for not just for cheaper, you know, software development innovation. It's not just about cybersecurity, but now it's also a question of digital democracy, um, increasing transparency in, um, into the kind of software that's being developed and used in the, the delivery of public services. We also heard this from the Swedish uh, employment agency uh, and others. Um, and also another, another interesting development is kind of an evolving understanding or understandings, plural, of digital sovereignty. Um, where this is, you know, includes, it's not just about states, nation states building software, open source software for their own use, but collaborating with each other. And a promising example here is, you know, the collaboration between Zendes and in, in Germany and Dinum in, in France, collaborating on La Suite and the Open Desk collaboration and Office tool suites that they have. 
So yeah, so lots of promising insights, good news and bad news. Yeah, and so how does how does an OSPO help with um, those kind of that, to address that adoption gap between knowing that it's important and knowing it can provide that digital um, you know, sovereignty that a lot of these states are looking for, um, but not really maybe knowing how to get started or how to incorporate open source in their systems. Yes, so the the interviews really highlighted that OSPOs are increasingly being understood as a really useful uh, mechanism for enabling collaboration at various levels uh, of, of the public sector. We see this at the municipal level, uh, for example, the OS2 network in Denmark, Sandbrook in Sweden, uh, and in other places of Europe. Um, we also see this at the international level, as I mentioned, collaboration between France and Germany, but there are other collaborations going on. Um, but we also heard that OSPOs are not a silver bullet, right? Uh, you can't just set up an OSPO and expect it to do its thing. Um, it's important that they are given the mandate, given the funding and the resources. And uh, one of the kind of uh, key arguments by, I'm not sure if Rasmus Frey is here from OS2 Network in Denmark, you know, they, these, these OSPOs work really well when they're working in a network. And so uh, Rasmus helps coordinate the OS2 network, which is a network of municipal government OSPOs in, in Denmark, where I think over 90% of municipal governments have now set up OSPOs and are working together to develop uh, shared uh, solutions for, for shared problems. So um, yeah, they have a big, big role to play, um, but not silver, silver bullet. Yeah. yeah, I see you nodding, Mirko. Do you have any kind of contributions to that adoption gap between different industries that, that recognize the value but are not yet adopting in Europe? <laughs> yes, I'll speak up a bit so that you can hear me. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, so one thing that we do notice... Can we hear Mirko? Okay. Maybe that will be better. Okay. I'll just continue and stop when they start drilling again. Um, so one thing that we clearly noticed is that there's, a, there's an adoption gap between the private sector and the public sector in terms of open source. The examples, the numbers that we've heard from Kaylin were um, that only a small majority of public sector actors have an open source strategy or built an OSPO. Um, what is an, what, why, does, why is an OSPO important here? It, it usually indicates that uh, on your journey of adopting open source, you come from or we're consuming it because it's also a problem for us, a technical problem, to we're engaging with this in a strategic way. We're thinking about how the organization should embrace it um, and, and how we should engage um, to make sure, for example, that certain functionality exists or that um, the, the dependencies that we use uh, are viable for a longer term as long as our uh, services are there. So um, having an OSPO typically indicates um, this kind of maturity in, in, in strategic thinking about open source. There are other ways to do it, other organizational setups, but currently we think OSPOs are kind of the most prominent ones. Um, and there's a huge gap. And um, I just want to highlight that in parallel, um, we, we talked about this gap in, in the adoption of open source in the public space. It's not regulation where we said we're actually seeing positive developments here. Um, it's more really in, in, in down-to-earth operations and, and, and providing um, public um, services based on open source technologies. And there, um, we just have to keep in mind that there is a certain contradiction here. Um, open source is a public good. It should be the most obvious for the public sector to embrace. Mm -hmm. And the benefits would be the, the, the largest because you can share your results with everybody and every, every municipality has to solve the same problems. Um, at the same time, that's where the biggest gaps are at the moment. I think we indicate that in the report really clearly and based on good research. So I think this hopefully helps us um, to, to establish such collaboration in the future. Yeah. Okay, I think I might switch gears a bit to um, the part of the report where we talk about emerging technology trends. Um, and so maybe initially we'll start with the security piece. Um, so Adrian, according to our report's data, um, how would you say that open source is perceived when it comes to security issues and questions? Yes, um, I think 2024 for open source security was a big year. Uh, we did see some high profile attacks, uh, for example, the exit backdoor, and I was a bit afraid on what the survey results might show us on software security and how people um, so we do have a question in there which says, um, do you perceive open source software to be more secure than closed software? Um, 
and I was afraid of the results of this question for this year because of the different attacks happening. But I have to say that there are good news. We didn't see a decrease in these numbers. Um, so even last year, around 70% of the people said that they do consider open source to be more secure. And this was um, kind of the same um, percentage in 2024. So I was really happy about that. Uh, and we also added another question in 2024, which was specifically asking about whether open source, whether the open source approach to software development leads to better software security um, compared to the closed approach. And we got an even higher number in Europe. It was 88% of uh, respondents agreeing with the statement. Um, so I was just very happy to see this and seeing that there's no decrease in trust, even though there, there are attacks. And I think this shows kind of the resilience of the open source community, knowing that transparency doesn't mean that there's going to be more attacks. We just see them more. Okay, maybe an AI question. Um, so, I, Kaylin, we have the AI expert on our panel. Um, so, uh, you know, we've seen... Uh, in our report and also outside of our report, we've seen efforts to uh, define, but also to guide open source AI. Um, and so what would you say is the value of these kinds of efforts? Yeah, thanks. Um, let me start with another statistics, uh, statistic before I get into the answer. So in the, in the survey, AI and machine learning ranked as the, above all other technologies, as the technology that would benefit the most from being open sourced with 43%. And also the question I ask myself when, when I read that is, well, what does it mean for you know, machine learning or AI to be open source? And I, as Gab mentioned in the keynote, we, there's a lot of confusion and open washing. And uh, I don't think as a community, we're, 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 we're trying to work towards a definition uh, of, of this. But you know, let's have a show of hands. Who here feels confident that they know what it means to open source ML or AI? Please raise your hands. OK, one half of a hand. And who feels a little bit confident that they could kind of point someone in the direction of what it means? Okay, this is more encouraging, about 10 hands. Yeah, so there are obviously different, I mean, different approaches. Uh, the Open Source Initiative has been running this co-design process for, for two years. Steph and Justin will be talking about where they're at at 2 o'clock today, so I recommend going there if you're interested in learning more. Mozilla ha has been working on it. and. Um, uh, myself and a few others from the Generative AI Commons, and Eli's here as well, and maybe others I haven't seen yet. And we developed a model openness framework, which is an approach to define, to, to or actually not to define, but provide guidance of, you know, what do, how do you break down an AI system, an open source AI system, and uh, under which licenses should those constituent parts be released? And, and um, as Gab mentioned, it's not a binary approach that we, we propose, but it's more of a sliding scale. With, it's a rank classification system with three levels, each level requiring a different uh, license, uh, uh, components. And for them, we recommend licenses. And I think this is the big contribution that we've made. Um, we uh, categorize these components into code, um, data, and content components and recommend licenses, as I mentioned. And a big one, for example, is how we should be licensing model weights, which to date have been released with um, open source software licenses, such as Apache V2, MIT, or new restrictive licenses. And we think this is inappropriate because uh, model weights are data components. So it'd be probably more appropriate to use open data licenses or to create uh, new ones that correspond to um, this, this specific attributes of model weights. Anyway. To answer your question, um, the the value of kind of working towards a definition is meant you know it may, is many fold, and I think one of the most important ones at the moment is um, for regulatory compliance. On the first of August uh, this year, the EU's AI Act kicked into effect. Uh, includes conditional exceptions for AI systems that are publicly released uh, under open uh, open free and open source licenses. So that really underlines the urgency to know okay well. How do you break that down and what licenses do you use? And I, I hope that um, the model openness framework that we've developed uh, you know, p helps push the needle and get us to an answer of how to do that uh, in a kind of transparent and safe way. Yeah. Uh, so I'd like to open up the, the floor for questions from the audience. Um, but in a final kind of maybe I'll let everyone respond to the um, maybe start with you, Kaylin, since uh, we just heard from you. What is what are the next steps? Maybe from your kind of AI and guiding and defining open AI. What are the next steps um, with this that we can use with this research and with this understanding? 
Mm, good question. Um, so when doing the interviews for this report, but also other times, um, you know, presenting them off, including to members of the audience who I see today, I've heard, well, it's exciting what's happening in the open AI, open source AI world, but there's so much, so many concerns about limited transparency, about safety, that we're not adopting these, you know, these models. You know, we're close to a million public uh, model repositories on the Hugging Face Hub. That's exciting, but how many of them are, are being, put, being put into production? Very few. Um, so I think we need to make some progress on, on safety and transparency best practices um, to, you know, realize some of the, the benefits that are promised by open source AI. Mirko, what's next with this watershed moment you described at the beginning? Well, first, I think we we should just recognize that there are some really interesting um, insights in, in, in the report as we have it present today. Um, the statement that um, a strong majority of our uh, correspondents here say, um, respondents say that um, they think that the open source development model creates more secure software than the closed model. Um, to me, it's kind of an end to a debate that has been gone for a very long, gone on for a very long time, where people said, "Well, there's kind of no difference here." Um, I think people are not buying this anymore. They expect that um, things that are security critical need to be open source, and my understanding is this is mostly a, di a distinction between an, a known unknown and an unknown unknown, where you say. Well, at least there I can look into it and see how insecure it is. And if you give me a proprietary piece of software, that's impossible. And I think that's, that's a very important outcome. And this is also like watershed. Like we had this debate, I think it's over. Um, and the other really important number and percentage is I think 82% of the respondents said public money, public code is their expectation. Um, we see in programs like Horizon Europe still um, um, IP policies that say, well, you can be open source, but if you have good reasons not to, then use our public money to create something that you then use proprietarily. And I think the report shows very clearly that that is not what European respondents expect from how their taxpayers' money is spent. And I think this is um, a very good development. Now, what does this mean moving forward? I think we will see just a continuing trend. Um, this is an ongoing development. This is not something that only happened this year. And we have a new European Parliament um, that will set new um, uh, policy priorities, and we will see how this plays out. But I think the strong trends, um, technology autonomy, understanding more, using open source strategically to, to ensure that, and to ensure transparency, and also to hopefully get to a good definition of open source AI. I think I expect a bit more consolidation now after the uh, more breakthrough um, uh, events this year and late last year. Hmm. Adrian, final thoughts? How does this research help direct these efforts? Yeah. Um, I think I think the surveys, our surveys are a great way to kind of confirm what our strategic decision makers in LF Europe, for example, or people working on the model openness framework, um, when they do this work, they can then look back to these results and say, yes, people want the public money, public code. Yes, people want AI to be, is one of the most cited open source technology that they want to see to be open sourced properly. Um, Mirko can say to the AI regulator or to the EU regulators that more, we ask more than 300 people and they are just uncertain about what this regulation will then, how it will translate in their organizations. So I, I'm hoping that these results are something that you can um, kind of bring into your works. And th I think that's what I'm most proud of. Um, and just working with the community, these numbers are numbers, but there are real people behind it. 328 people telling us their uh, responses and each of the surveys are something that I um, care for carefully. and. Um, I hope you can um, kind of help us contribute in the next year, for example, when we do Europe Spotlight 2025, on what are the key areas we should focus on, what are the questions that we should ask, um, and how the report should look like, because this is all of our efforts on getting this done. So thank you. Okay. Yeah, let's go for it. Go ahead. Uh, do we need to pass you a mic? Thanks, Adrian. Hi, my name is Annie Lai. I'm a 
um, I represent Generative AI Commons. I just want to say um, <clears throat> at 325 today, um, I'll have a talk called Unleashing Collective Genius, Building Generative AI Through Open Collaborations. I will cover MOTH, Model Openness Framework, and Model Openness Tool. Later, please come to my session 325. Um, I have a question for the panelists. So obviously, we know that it's important to for the European community to you know, develop um, technology, autonomy, and sovereignty, but also there's a lot of value for global collaboration. So how do we strike a balance so we don't run into a fragmentation situation? I can try to answer that because we've been dealing with this topic a lot, as you know, in the last 12 months. Um, essentially, your question pin points to one of the strongest contradictions that we see in how most at the regulatory level, um, we, we embrace open source technologies. Um, the question here is, do we use the model to build our own technologies that we control? Or is the model that we contribute to the global pool of technologies and learn the expertise to operate them for our own benefit and so that we can control it? These are two different approaches and it's unfortunately in a way, a path decision. You can either decide to roll your own or you decide to collaborate with the others. Um, and th I think this is an open debate. This is an open, actual political discussion that is still ongoing and is undecided. Um, and it's probably one of the most important decisions that we will see in Europe. Um, of course, we're here at the Open Source Summit, so we're all um, big fans of open collaboration and our collaboration is global. Um, and that's something that we probably have to um, you know, make our opinions heard for, about and say that we think open source is global. You cannot have your own physics and you cannot have your own open source in a way. But yeah, as I said, this is an open decision and um, especially in Europe, it will probably be made mostly in Brussels and we need to continue the work of communicating what we think about the open source ecosystem. Um, we will do that. That's what I've been doing the last couple of months. Um, but everybody else can do it too. So. I'll just add to that. Um, of course, there's a lot of rhetoric uh, from governments about, for example, sovereignty. Um, but yeah, as I said earlier, one of the findings we found from uh, governments in Europe that for them, the meaning of digital sovereignty means working together internationally uh, on kind of shared software that they can then use for their own ends. Um, and also, there have been a number of events in the last year which are quite promising as well. So, for example, the UN event that, you know, had sta um, stakeholders and foundations, had governments from across the world. It, um, you could argue it had a skew towards North America and Western Europe, but there were stakeholders from other parts of the world too, or the recent open source Congress in Beijing, uh, where, you know, Chinese and, and various other kind of international foundations came together to talk about uh, opportunities for collaboration. So I, I think even though there is this rhetoric, um, what is happening in, in, in practice and action is, is promising. Other questions? Here, I'm more mobile. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, you mentioned that OSPO is the most prominent uh, way uh, or the most pr prominent model of organizing uh, open source strategy for organizations. I was wondering if there's any research or data on other models and uh, what is their um, implementation or, or how, how popular are they? Uh, so actually we do have research on where we ask organizations about specifically about their OSPOs and I wasn't working on this specific research this year, it was Steve Hendrick, but I do know that um, we we try to aim for an approach where we don't say actually an OSPO, because we know that in many organizations that this looks different, uh, the public sector or like very regulated sectors might really have a different structure based on uh, their specific industries and sectors. Um, so I believe the term we kind of used is open source initiatives or um, I'm not sure, really sure about the exact um, term, um, but we kind of opened this up and 
the 2023 report is already available on our website, and the 2024 is currently under development with um, Ana Jimenez giving us a lot of subject matter expertise on the topic, um, who's in the to-do to -do group um, and is doing a lot for OSPOS. Um, so I would just probably go to that um, report, but maybe if Mirko and Kaylin see anything. The 2024 there. report will be published at Member Summit. Mm. Yeah, I'll just build on it and then Thomas, I see you have your hand up. Um, I, I just want to be clear that uh, we say that OSPOs are emerging and there's a consensus emerging that it's, you know, one of the most effective mechanisms, but not the most effective mechanism for driving you know, open source adoption and, and reuse and development in the public sector. Um, but yeah, I would, I've heard Anna say time and time again, this phrase, it's either my OSPO is not your OSPO, your OSPO is not my OSPO, which is to indicate that there is a difference in how they're organized, their responsibilities, and many aren't called uh, OSPOs, um, but that's kind of like the centralizing concept at the moment. But yeah, thank you. And Thomas, I know you've been involved with Anna a lot uh, working on the to-do group. Is there something you wanted to ask or say? Yeah, so there is a research reports from the to-do group I work for as well. But you can also look at, if you're in a financial institution, uh, Finos uh, also have a big report on how they have a And I think possibly Open Chain, which cover, uh, is more about the uh, standards and trust, they have, for, because especially in Asia, OSPOs are not really the going term, and they have different forms on how they organize. But say in the West, most of the time, the OSPOs are a really good vehicle because it usually works well with like agile developments or engineer productivity developments, but they said, Different cultures have different ways of approaching things, and that's why the the, the slogan, yeah, my OSPO is not your OSPO, is, is very applicable. Now, I'm still not happy about the word open source initiatives, but we need to work on finding an alternative term that captures kind of an operational center of excellence for open source, but that's like a whole word for, but that's usually what we use in the surveys. <laughs> Any other questions? We have four minutes. Oh, yeah. Thank you for the surveys. Even if they sometimes repeat the topic uh, again and again, this is extremely helpful if I work with the German administration, for example. And um, at, at least in, the, in, in Germany, uh, I think we have a process of that, that they are finding their relation to open source, just to say it. So there are pro and contra arguments and um, the best uh, strategy I found is uh, to be supportive in a way that, for example, I helped create open code, so the GitLab for the German government, and then I was pulled in the Open Desk project and, and uh, have also helped a little bit uh, funding the um, sovereign tech fund. Uh, and I have uh, lots of contacts in, um, in the background, so if you... Uh, want to uh, contact me, uh, and then then uh, I could give you a lot of uh, insights on that. Unfortunately, most of the documents which are public are in German, so um, Mirko at least is able to read it. <laughs> and, and then uh, um, just to say that. And I will give a talk on that on, on Wednesday. don't know exactly when. So just come. I think we have two minutes. The final question. Timo. Okay. Timo Perala, and I think maybe at this context I'm LF Europe Advisory Board member. Um, maybe not a question, but a comment about this 51% of not knowing about what's the impact of the CRA on their engagement would be. Um, I think it's an, sort of an interesting bucket because I have been now following CRA for more than 12 months and I'm, I'm on that one. I have absolutely no clue. So it's like it, it would be interesting to know who of those 51 percent were totally clueless or they are like me understanding that it's <laughs> a bit of a complicated matter and nobody knows yet. So we have the legal text and we are waiting for 40 plus documents to emerge to explain what it means. 
So, yeah, I think it's a good place to be to say that, no, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I will work on it and for it, and, and then we'll find out. Mirko, do you want to give a shout out for your latest research report? Or not? <laughs> Whatever your thought was. <laughs> yeah, so first of all, thank you, Timo, for all your work with us. Um, the uncertainty that, that you highlight is really palpable, and, and you're right. It's like the, the answer, I don't know, or I'm not sure in this case, may really be two different buckets. Like, I've never looked into this, or I've studied it, and I still have no clue what it means. <laughs> um, and, and I must say, for the cyber resilience side, um, I've read it, and, and yes, it's a long read, but it's actually worth it. And, and you can, in a way, understand the basic provisions of it. Um, and as you say, we're still waiting for 41 standards documents to come, and there will be guidance document, and then hopefully everything will come more clear. In comparison, I have read the AI Act twice. I don't know what it will bring. It is a, it's an enigma to me. There are so many, <laughs> so many um, assumptions in there about how the technology will emerge and what the capability of the technology the capabilities of the technology will be and how humans will then use it. That, for me, I cannot predict how this will play out. With the Cyber Resilience Act, it feels to me like a manageable process. Yes, there are knowns, but we can sort them out. AI Act, it's for Kaylin, he will have to take care of it. <laughs> so, maybe, maybe just maybe quickly adding on that sort of anecdotal evidence. Like just last week, I was in a, in a European kind of standardization context meeting where somebody and reveal that they have been reading the CRA three times now, from A to Z. And every time they get a little bit or more different understanding of what this animal is about. So yes, please go and read it, because it impacts all of us in this room and in, in this venue. But yes, it, it needs time to digest. I think that's... Can I add to some words in defense of the AI Act before we finish? Sure. So I think maybe, you know, just in its defense, I think what is very useful and noble about it is the uh, tiered risk-based approach. And I think you know, it's creates certain uh, level of understanding agreement across Europe and hopefully beyond Europe about what certain use cases of AI applications, AI systems are not acceptable. Um, and then in terms of the, the other tiers, we'll see how it's implemented and yeah. Okay, I think we're at time. Um, so thanks everyone, really great turnout. Nice to see everybody here and we'll see you around.